You're listening to CKNW's Chief Executives, live from SFU's Beatty School of Business, presented by Fortis PC, energy solutions for every customer. Thank you for doing this. Good morning. Good morning. Tell me a little bit about you. I want to find out about uh, Fortress Paper in a, in a little while, but I'm always curious about uh, how our CEOs got started. You grew up in Calgary. Yeah, born and raised in Calgary. I uh, sort of grew up in a middle-income type family. We lived uh, relatively near a golf course. Uh, we were not on the golf course, and it was actually collecting golf balls was my first business, and that's sort of what changed everything for me and got me into the business world. How old were you then? I uh, started when I was nine. Now, a lot of people start with a lemonade stand or even uh, uh, picking up golf balls and selling them, but uh, it sounds to me like you knew right from that moment that uh, business was in your blood. Yeah, it was less business and more an interest in money that, uh, that drove it. I mean, I was, I was nine, I was uh, walking down the street with a friend, and I watched someone else go into a pond collecting these golf balls, and I recognized there's value there, and that's just sitting there, and I just couldn't take it anymore. I had to get in there, and the water was blue, and I can only imagine what else was in there, but uh, dove right in, started collecting them, and then started selling them back to the golfers. Within a couple of weeks, you know, I'd amassed probably a thousand golf balls. Uh, found all the other places on the course to collect them, then started hiring kids to collect them for me. Uh, <clears throat> on a weekend, I, a good tournament weekend, I could make $1,000. And of course, it's no cost of, uh, of the inventory, no taxes, no rent, no food, no nothing. So uh, you, you can start to build up the, the piggy bank pretty quick, and that's uh, what attracted me to it. But were you thinking of all those things at, at 9 and 10 years old? Yeah, it was just, uh, again, I was doing odd jobs around the house. Anything I could do to earn more money and I was really uh, became quite frugal with the interest of collecting and uh, you know hoarding away uh, my, my nuts the uh, I didn't want to spend them I didn't want to relinquish them and that was sort of a, the driving factor all the way through so where did you go from there uh, from there uh, my parents actually uh, helped push me in the right direction they finally uh, laid down the law and said you know you have your own money you've got to start spending it so I wanted the first video game it was a, an Atari 2600 so I went down to the store, I think it was about $450, $500, and I just wasn't willing to part with my money. So my parents said, well, they, they have these things called the classified ads, and you know, there's a paper. So we picked that up. In Calgary, it's called the uh, bargain finder, uh, the buy and sell out here. And so I picked that up, called up all the different uh, ones that were for sale, obviously starting with the best deals, uh, figured them out geographically on a map, had my mother drive me around that night. The best one, or the best deal, happened to be the last one on the list, uh, and they said, you know, it's your money, you do what you want, so they sent me up to the door, with my pocket full of cash, and it just, that's got me into negotiating, which uh, now I love to do. So, walk up to the doors, by the end of the night I bought three of the four, because I really wanted that last one, it was by far the best deal, and the following week I put them up for sale uh, in the paper. So very quickly I got out of the golf ball industry and into uh, anything that I was interested in, and buying and selling them. So at any one time, I'd have a hundred of these Atari video games in my basement and selling the games separately and uh, back and forth. And then I was interested in skateboards, so I started buying and selling skateboards, BMX bikes, uh, and various things like that. And so I, it actually started skipping school on Thursdays and Fridays. Thursdays, the paper would come out, so I would do all my work and all my calls and buy things over the phone because I was trying to monopolize sectors. So like the Atari, you just call them up and say, I have, I'll, I'll give you this, yep. Okay, you need to guarantee I'm driving across town. If I'm coming, I own it. You can't sell it to anyone else, but I'm committed. I'm coming. So basically buy up all the cheap ones. Of course, there's a few others for sale in that section. They're all mine. So Friday, I would spend all day selling, selling them back to everybody. So trying to really control and, uh, and corner these markets. So then I also got interested in, again, where can I find opportunities to buy and sell things? So uh, my parents took me to an auction so that, you know, I started picking up a few things there, uh, anything I could sort of flip, I guess, Robert Bateman prints, gold, diamonds, just anything that was called... But now you're how old? 12, 13, 14. <laughs> uh, and one of my biggest events, or biggest wins, or biggest uh, memorable uh, scores, I guess, we had a snowstorm in Calgary, and obviously Calgary's used to snow, and they've got great snow, snow removal equipment. But all of a sudden, it was just too much for them to handle, so the school's closed for a couple days. So I thought, you know, there's opportunity here, but I just got to figure out where. Of course, the obvious one is shovel snow, but there's only so much time and only so, much, so many driveways. And So I called around to some of these auctions, and we found an unreserved auction where uh, they were still planning to go ahead. So it took us about an hour and a half to get there. It should have been a 15-minute drive. 
Uh, there were only four or five of us showed up in the room, and it fairly quickly became a, a wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Okay, you know, let you have this one, that thousand dollar item for a hundred bucks, but you don't bid on the next one. It, it'll be my turn, and we just cleaned up that night. I mean, I, I kept one of the Robert Bateman prints. Uh, it was about a fifteen hundred dollar print that I paid a hundred dollars for, and it was just sort of a, a memento of that evening. And did you keep it? I still have it. My parents have it at their house. What did your dad do? He was uh, in oil and gas. He went to UBC out here and then quickly got uh, employed in the oil and gas sector. So he was a geophysicist doing seismic, uh, looking for various oil and gas deposits out there, and they got based there. Now, did you spend any time being a kid? Not a lot. It was uh, a unique uh, childhood. I can't say it was a... Looking back on it now, I have some regrets on it. It wasn't a great childhood. Uh, not because of my parents. They were spectacular, but I really missed out on a lot of things. Like what? Being a kid, just having fun. Did you play hockey? Played hockey until I was about 11 or 12, uh, mm -hmm. and it was just getting so much, so much time commitment. Uh, again, I was busy buying and selling things and just trying to uh, squirrel away some, uh, <laughs> some money for the future. So I really, uh, you know, as I said, if I had, had to do it over again, I think I would have done it a little bit different. It was uh, a challenge growing up. Didn't have a lot of friends, got bullied in school. Also probably led to me you know, staying at home more. Um, my mother was a principal, and in grade, I think it was grade 11, uh, might have been grade 12, but uh, you know, I get hauled into the principal's office, mother in tow, uh, and again, she was a principal at another school. Sorry, we have a problem here. We are pretty confident your son's a drug dealer. What? <laughs> that was, I mean, it was totally out of the blue. My mother's eyes light up, like, what's going on? He's got a lot of cash, he's driving a Porsche 911, uh, he's never in school. There's only one conclusion here. My mother you know, starts to laugh and she knows exactly where I am and exactly what I'm doing. And the deal I had with her is as long as I stayed on the honor roll, uh, I could do whatever I want. So I could stay up as long, late as I want because she knew, she knew I was working. It's not like I was uh, hanging out at the 7-Eleven or getting into trouble. So. But again, it was a, a unique and different childhood probably than most. It certainly sounds like it. Uh, you did come to UBC. Yes. And took? Uh, urban geography and <clears throat> economics. So I wanted to get into uh, land development, but uh, slowly migrated into the finance world and buying and selling companies. We'll pick up on that uh, when we come back. We're broadcasting live, <coughs> excuse me, from the Simon Fraser University School of Business, the BD School of Business, uh, a presentation of Fortis, B.C. Talking with uh, Chad Wazalinkoff, the uh, CEO and president of uh, Fortress Paper, we heard about a very unusual uh, but uh, profitable uh, childhood. Uh, from university, what did you do? Uh, so while I was going to university, I was working uh, as well. Uh, obviously, I had to commit a lot of time to school and hitting the books. I generally didn't attend classes. I think I had, we figured it out one day, I had something like 16 classes I had to attend per week. And I think I went to 20 or 21 classes the entire semester. So I would, had a couple of odd jobs. I'd work construction during the day. Uh, in the evenings, I actually helped rebuild a coffee shop up near UBC. And then uh, they offered me a job. So I became a, a barista serving coffee, which was great. Because the coffee shop wasn't doing very well. So there was really no customers. So I would just sit at the till and read and do all my studying there to get uh, paid for it. So Probably the only barista with a Porsche 911. Yeah. <laughs> do you still have one? Uh, I do. Yeah. <laughs> nice. Um, fortress paper. It's not, it's not something that probably everybody listening would be familiar with. It's not a big retail company. And so tell me a little bit about Fortress, what it does, and what you have done with it. Okay. So Fortress was officially founded by myself in 2006, but I got in, interested in the forestry industry in 2005. Uh, it was an industry that had a huge erosion of capital, no investor confidence, uh, and there were just some great opportunities out there. So I started scouring the planet, looking for any uh, opportunity that might make sense. Uh, there were a lot of very good deals out there. You, know, you could buy a newsprint mail that they spent hundreds of millions of dollars on. You could buy it for a dollar, uh, and they're still the, the same way. But as you dig a little deeper, it's, you know, it's an eroding business. Uh, obviously, everything's going to iPads and Kindles and things like that. So challenging time. Uh, we looked at pulp mills, lumber mills, things like things that were more on the commodity side. And what I finally found was some specialty or niche products still had great uh, growth opportunities. So the ideal characteristic, which we were able to secure, had 
significant barriers to entry. The underlying products had double-digit growth, uh, and of course we could get the asset at the right price. So the first asset I bought uh, was a wallpaper mill in Germany. It was making various grades of wallpaper, and uh, this was in 2006. Uh, we wanted to change the entire product mix to go to this new non-woven product. So it's wallpaper that is dry strippable. You can peel the corner away just like regular paper, but you don't have to steam it off and take all those little tears. It comes off in one seamless pull. So we felt that was coming into the market. Uh, it was going to take, take over the wallpaper market. Even though it's a mature industry, that particular product was growing within it. So we bought that asset for 5 million euros. We've dividended out in the last uh, five, six years probably about 20 million euros of profits. I never put another dollar into it, and we just recently sold it to uh, Glattfelter, New York Stock Exchange listed company, for 160 million euros. So it was a great uh, flip, so to speak, a little better than the, uh, some of the artwork and, and BMX bikes. So but, uh, buy low, sell high. Ideally, that's how it works. It doesn't always work that way, but that's... <laughs> but how do you know, like, a wallpaper company in Germany, how do you, how do you target that? How do you even hear about it? I just try to keep the network going with accountants and lawyers, uh, different financiers, uh, and again, I'm using, I now invest in out-of-favor sectors, so a lot of deals come to me. So again, forestry is challenged right now. Most companies are just trying to survive. It's all about cost-cutting, uh, and again, just trying to make it through. None of them are really thinking about growth. So if anyone needs capital, they don't have it internally. The investment community is unlikely to give it to them in, in a lot of circumstances, or it's challenging. So these things just end up on my doorstep. So again, through the various consultants, uh, forestry consulting firms, etc., uh, I get to see a lot of different uh, opportunities. But when everybody else is running away, you're gravitating to something. Yes. Ideally, the more challenging or the more problems a mill has or an opportunity has, the more excited I get. I, I look at a lot of opportunities. I do very, very few. Uh, you know, it has to meet all the various criteria. Uh, but there's, you know, when you put them together, and they often take a year to two years to put together, usually we've covered off all the basis, and we actually, people say I'm a high-risk investor because I'm going to these areas where no one else will venture. I feel I'm probably the, the biggest chicken and the lowest-risk investor out there because I'm getting in at such a low entry point, and, you know, there's very little chance of failure, so to speak. Well, what gives you the confidence to think that you can grow a business that everybody else is failing in? Again, each opportunity is different, but I'll, uh, I'll give an example of my last acquisition. We haven't turned it on yet, but uh, so it's a pulp mill up in northern Quebec. Uh, the previous owner spent about six, seven hundred million refurbishing it. Total asset value today to rebuild it would be about a billion and a half dollars. Uh, there were some serious environmental issues. Again, I like problems and challenges, uh, and nobody wanted to touch it. So I convinced the Quebec government. Uh, they took all the uh, environmental liability because, you know, in this current financial environment we're in, it's all about creating jobs or saving jobs. This mill has been shut for six years, so huge job creation in a northern town where there's no other opportunity to create that many jobs. So with that, the government took all the environmental liability. Uh, we were able to pick up the asset for one dollar uh, and take on none of that uh, risk. The unions, uh, you know, it's a challenging time. They want their jobs, so there was, we had to uh, agree and coming up with a 15 percent wage discount uh, based on national wage rates. We were able to get a large power contract with the government that helps bring our cost structure down. So we're taking a mill that was making NBSK, uh, which is a commodity type product, and we're going to convert it to make dissolving pulp, which is a, a niche product or a specialty product with these double digit growth rates. So it goes from a high cost producer and we bring it down to a, a low cost producer. And again, this can only be done in a, my view, in a time when there's financial stress because you need so much government support. They're going to end up providing us several hundred millions of dollars for the retrofit that's required for this mill. So again, when I say I view it as low risk, we're in for a dollar, and the government's putting up several hundred millions of dollars, versus the high risk, in my view, was originally building that mill for a billion and a half dollars, and then unfortunately it didn't work out and they had to shut it down. And how many people do you employ there? Uh, that one's, we're just turning it around. It'll employ 350 people directly, and it the government feels it'll create about 4,000 indirect jobs in the region because people cutting down the trees and hauling the wood and things like that. And how many people do you employ overall? Uh, right now, I think we're about six or 700. We uh, sold our wallpaper mill, so we've got about 250 in Switzerland and just under 400 in our other mill in Quebec and then another uh, banknote operation that I bought off the Bank of Canada. We employ about 20 people there. 
To what degree are you involved uh, in the U.S.? No operations in the U.S. We do uh, look at some joint development work with them in uh, our various uh, banknote security products, but we're not uh, at liberty to go into much detail on that. But the, the gridlock that they're experiencing in the States and the potential for default doesn't have a big impact on you? Not a direct impact. Obviously, I think it would be a disaster if uh, they don't get their act together and, and clean up this debt ceiling and keep things moving forward. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a precarious time. It's a challenging time financially around the world, and we just don't need this additional issue to uh, stagnate things further. With the growth of GDP and consumer spending, it does generally help uh, all our various products. Talking with uh, Chad Wazalinkoff, the president and CEO of Fortress Paper, a uh, presentation of Fortis Energy, our principal sponsor here as we're broadcasting from the Beatty School of Business at SFU's downtown campus. <laughs> Talking with Chad Wazalinkoff, uh, he was the Entrepreneur of the Year in 2010, and I think by now you have figured out uh, why. <laughs> I'm curious in terms of uh, what you look to in the future. To what degree do you try to predict what the economy is going to be like in BC, in Canada, in, in the world? Yeah, I'm, I'm, <clears throat> when I look for opportunities, I usually go, uh, you know, I look for these macro events first. Uh, so when I got into dissolving pulp, as an example, where we've bought one mill and we're converting another, what drove me in there, again, it was forestry related, but it was looking at population growth. That's something I just don't think is ever going to change, or at least not for several decades. So I can feel comfortable and confident that if I invest in something where population growth is going to be a driver, okay, I can check that box uh, in terms of not having to worry about it. People moving up in income status, uh, same type of thing. Again, all these uh, developing countries, I think it's going to continue. So, I, again, I can get at that comfort level. With that increasing income status, they're buying more food and they're buying more de uh, dairies and meats and things like that. So, again, it's going to put pressure on agricultural land. So, where, so I can buy a farm, I can look at the different products. I said, okay, trying to evaluate that. Where's, where's the most pressure going to be? Which commodity within agriculture is going to face the biggest challenge? And that was cotton. It requires the most herbicides, fertilizers, pesticides, uh, aggressive user of water, requires very irritable land. And again, it's not required to eat. So then I really feel cotton's going to have uh, these challenging times going forward. Again, we, we all know where the environmental pressures are coming. And in places where they grow it, even in China, again, they're putting more and more uh, focus on the environment these days. So if cotton can't make it, or it's going to go through uh, the most challenges, that's where it got me into dissolving pulp. Dissolving pulp is used to make rayon or viscose, and it's the most ideal substitute for cotton. So again, it wasn't looking at a country or a region or anything like that. It was these macro events, these, this huge storm that's building, tons of pressure behind it, and it's just this driving force that I feel is unwavering that allows me to go in and take on these opportunities. What about the secure paper business? Is that something that uh, is growing as people are more and more concerned with security and privacy? Yeah, banknote industry grows at about 4 to 5 percent a year, which is great. Good times and bad, so it's sort of recession proof, which is great. Very high barriers to entry. National banks are just not willing to take a chance on a new supplier. So it's not going to go to one of these uh, developing countries because labor is cheaper. Because, uh, again, they're just not going to take a chance on their banknotes or passports being made in a foreign jurisdiction like that. The challenge we faced with our particular mill uh, is it's based in Switzerland. Uh, when I bought it, that was our best calling card. We would get premium pricing, uh, and everything was great. But with this financial crisis, everyone has flooded into a couple of currencies, and the Swiss franc being one of them. So we used to trade. Uh, most, of, most banknotes are produced in the Eurozone. We make ours in Switzerland, as I said. And when Greece looked like it was coming out of the euro, uh, the exchange rate went from about 140 uh, to almost parity. So we were operating with contracts, you know, a three-year contract. We used to make 20% profit margins on it, and the exact same contract. Now we're losing 20%. So the company went through tough, tough times just because of this global issue. Our waste rates were better. Our productivity was better. So we, the guys at the mail were doing everything right. Uh, I just got caught up in this, this macro theme that I hadn't planned for. Uh, a meltdown of Lehman Brothers and AIG, <laughs> everything else that happened. But when it gets back, you know, we're confident that business will turn around. Even in a challenging currency environment like that, we've continued to make improvements, and now we've gotten it back to break even, which doesn't sound great because we've got about a hundred million dollar investment in that mill. Uh, but at least it's 
not bleeding anymore. And when the currency gets back to normal, it'll, we're confident it'll be very yeah, Are those currencies going to come back? I mean, it wasn't long ago that we were talking about a collapsing Greece, a collapsing Portugal, a collapsing Spain. Is that starting to correct? We're, you know, the time I spend over in Europe, I can definitely see it. The confidence is coming back for sure. People are starting to spend again. Uh, you know, it's, there's going to be some uh, austerity measures still required. These governments have to tighten their belts, and they have to go through a little bit of pain. Uh, but I think the eurozone is going to make it, and the euro currency is going to make it. Uh, I think it was uh, a mistake to begin with, but that's uh, too late now. Once they were into it, they, they can't back it out. It would be t too disastrous. To what degree is technology changing your life, your business, the work you do? It's unfortunately made, uh, made me very accessible. So it's not uncommon for me to get a phone call uh, f from my lawyers at 2 in the morning, and they know exactly it's 2 in the morning where I am in the world, and I'll call again at 4 in the morning and 5 in the morning. Uh, you know, people expect an email to be returned within the hour, not later that day. So work is now, it's 24-7. You know, we all know it's becoming a very global environment and a global uh, financial industry. And there's always somebody up and somebody's working away and they want to get a hold of you. So I'm uh, a burden to my BlackBerry tied to it. When we come back, I want to talk a little bit about uh, your life today. Uh, it sounds in the beginning like you didn't have a childhood. You've got a tremendous business life. But I also know that you're married and you've got kids, and I want to know a little bit about how you manage that. And if you, if you have a family life today as an adult, uh, looking back on, on the childhood you described. So we'll be back with more with Chad Wazelenkoff, the uh, CEO of Fortress Paper, a presentation of Fortis Energy, our signature sponsor. We're broadcasting from the Beatty School of Business at the downtown SFU campus. <laughs> Talking with Chad Wazelenkoff from uh, Fortis Paper. You described a, a childhood that uh, I think had most people here shaking their heads, some in wonder, uh, others wondering uh, <laughs> how, you, how you developed such a business acumen and focus on money, money, money from the age of nine. Uh, talk about your life today. Do you have, a, you have a family? Do you have time for that family? Not as much as I'd like. Uh, you know, they're, they're obviously the most important thing to me, and I wish uh, I could spend more time with them. Uh, but you know, the demands of this, this job and this business uh, require me to be on the plane a lot and traveling a lot. So we're in the process of trying to move down to Bermuda and Palm Springs and just sort of restart everything and get more time together. But uh, it still hasn't found its foundations yet, so not as much time as I'd like to How be How old are your them. kids? I've got two boys, five and seven. Do any of them look like born entrepreneurs? I think so. They're uh, asking about chores around the house. We're not, we don't force them to do chores, uh, but they're asking about it. They want to earn some money and things like that, so I can actually see it's where it's going, and I'm, I'm, to be honest, reluctant to nurture it. I think most parents would get excited about that, but I've been down that path, and maybe it's best they don't go that way. Yeah, but you've done pretty well. I guess it depends. I, I don't have a great balance. Uh, you know, you're asking about family, so I'm sure most people here had uh, a great Thanksgiving dinner and had turkey, etc. Uh, unfortunately, my family's down in the States, so Sunday night I was working all day, uh, reading reports, and I a couple of large legal documents. Finally, it was about 6, 6.30. I was just too tired to go out. And so open up the freezer. There's something frozen in the back corner. I don't know if it was pierogies or gyoza. I was like, well, that's my only option. So I chisel that off the back and throw them on the stove, cook them up. And that was my uh, Thanksgiving. I sit in a nice big house, but sitting there by myself. So, Do you work out? Do you do anything for fitness? Uh, I used to play hockey. I was on uh, six teams. Uh, I was playing every single night pretty well. And then the summers, I was on six softball teams. Uh, you know, we won one year. We won men's A nationals. So we were the best in the country. Co-ed nationals. I was MVP uh, of, of the nation. So I'm very sports oriented, but I have absolutely no time. So any time I have, uh, is I try to spend with the family. So because I'm on a plane so much. I'm just rushing around, and again, I just got to try to find that time. You talked about taking calls from lawyers at two o'clock in the morning, four o'clock in the morning. Talk about a typical day. Is there such a thing in your life? When do you get up in the morning? Uh, typically, physically get out of bed around 5.30, uh, pick up the Blackberry, sit up in bed, uh, and get going. Just look for any emergencies or big fires to put out. Uh, I don't go into the office anymore. Uh, I physically don't have the time. Uh, my office, when I was living here, I was 
It's only a 20-minute commute, but I physically did not have the 20 minutes to be offline, just trying to keep up with everything and emails and calls, etc. So it's not uncommon for me to have no meetings in a day, but I'm just buried with you know, three, four hundred uh, emails, each of which obviously require responses, reading legal documents. So I usually sh start to shut it down around nine, ten o'clock at night. So it's work, 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 work. All work. Seven days a week. Christmas you take, day. Do you take time to, to read a book? No. Do you ever go to a movie? I've been to one movie with my kids in, and that, other than that, I think it was 12 years ago was the last time I was in a theater. Wow. You're talking about uh, moving your family to Palm Springs and Bermuda. Yeah. What will, what will that do for your kids? What I'm hoping it will do will change the, my uh, personal tax rate, which will allow me to get comfort so that I can uh, retire and spend more time with them. So that's still my goal is to uh, put enough away to, to throw in the towel and call it a day. At what age? Your early 40s yeah. now, right? Yeah, 40. So when would you like to retire? When I'm 35. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to imagine what retirement would look like for you, never having taken the time to have fun. Yeah, I, I, I did retire twice, in fact. It uh, didn't really take that long. I started playing golf with my friends, uh, saying let's meet at the bar after work or even at lunch, which may have been a little... Extended, extended lunches, and then they were getting in trouble. So I didn't have anyone to play with. Uh, I got bored really, really quick, and then I got sucked back into the business world. And if I'm in it, I'm all in, because I just see opportunity. I see where there's a new interesting area or an angle you can take advantage of. But to do these things, you've got to be fast, quick, better than everyone else, more efficient than everyone else, really get after it. And otherwise, it's just not worth doing that. I may as well sit on the sidelines. So what would retirement look like? Now that I have kids, uh, I'm ready to do it. And I think it would take, because I'm just not spending enough time with them. I was, as an example, went out to play. Uh, my son is now getting into baseball. And, uh, of course, the wife's taking him to all the games and things like that. So I finally was able to get to one game, and he wasn't doing well. So I took him out in the backyard. And, you know, I've got a, I was very, very athletic uh, and fairly good at all the different sports. And tried to play catch with my 7-year-old son. He could barely catch a ball. And I felt, uh, you know, I've missed the ball here myself a little bit of what's important. So looking to make some changes in the coming years. You just got to get things in the right, you know, put, the, put all the pieces together just so I can leave things on a, in a good standing. I, I don't think a retirement will take forever, but I'd like to get the next four or five years with my kids, which is really important to me before I can't get that again. Talking with Chad Wazelenkoff from uh, Fortress Paper, a presentation of Fortis, B.C. We're broadcasting from the SFU campus of the BD School of Business. And we'll be back with uh, we, we, what we like to call our Vanity Fair questions. If uh, Mr. Wazelenkoff could have dinner with uh, anyone, living or dead, who would they be and why? And we'll be right back. <laughs> we are back with uh, Chad Wazelenkoff. We're at uh, the Beatty School of Business at Simon Fraser University, a, a presentation of Fortis, B.C. We gave you a little less warning not, uh, not by intent, but uh, we like to do, and this is often the most interesting to people listening, the Vanity Fair question of if you could have dinner with any four people, living or dead, remember you've got to take time to have dinner, okay. <laughs> who would they be and why? Uh, I think Steve Jobs would be uh, fairly high on the list. Obviously he's been uh, spectacular what he uh, did during his lifetime got kicked out of his own company uh, and they asked him back and uh, you know he had the the courage and was willing to come back even though again he'd been uh, forced out and obviously he's done some great things spectacular company that's really changed all of our lives uh, you know the imagination that he has had the, the driving force that he has had the, one of the questions I'd love to ask is how do you create these absolutely breathtaking world-class spectacular products with thousands of employees uh, working on these products, and yet nobody knows about it until the launch. Because uh, again, if I mean, we all like to talk and you know, pillow talk with the wife, and hey, I'm working on this, and this new cool thing is about to come out, yet it really doesn't leak out. So I don't know how he's been able to accomplish that. Especially in the Twitter world. No, exactly. All it takes is one little leak, and of course, everyone would love to know what they're working on, yet it doesn't really come out. Mm -hmm. Starting to more with watches and some of the things, but again, 
some of the previous products were great. Who else? Uh, Thomas Edison. Uh, you know, I would say fairly similar to Steve Jobs in his time. Uh, you know, fairly cavalier, willing to take on some risks. New innovative products that again have just completely changed our world. Uh, so again, he'd be high, high on the list. Okay. Uh, Warren Buffett. I was seeing myself being in the finance world and buying and selling companies. It's, as we all know, things are just happening faster and the swings are bigger and things are more volatile and it's just an ever-changing world. I get Warren Buffett and, and again, I admire his lifestyle too. He just sits back in his chair and looks at a good company and says, yeah, I'll buy that and I'm not even going to think about it for 30 or 40 years and obviously he's proven us, I don't know why I'm working so bloody hard trying to grind it all out. <laughs> So I'd love to get uh, you know, some, some proper advice from him. Uh, and I guess the last person would be uh, Donald Trump. Uh, you know, he's been a little cavalier and a little bit uh, you know, pushing the limits. Uh, he's built uh, an interesting brand for himself with some, uh, some ups and downs. Uh, as I mentioned, I don't read books, but when I was a kid, uh, I was reading books. When I was 10, 11, 12, I was reading all these autobiographies, Lee Iacocca, Ray Kock, uh, Suzuki, etc. And one of the ones that stuck with me was uh, Donald Trump. That's why I, when I went to university, I wanted to get into land development, just the various things he's done and the things he's grown and, and built. And again, uh, I, think he'd, I think he'd make for an interesting dinner. I'm sure he would. You might not get a word in, but it would yeah. be an interesting dinner. But it, it's, it's also it's fascinating because he, he and uh, Warren Buffett are so different. Yeah. I mean, Buffett, from everything I've read about him, is very low-key. Uh, not flamboyant, uh, has tons of money, but doesn't spend it uh, in any kind of uh, flashy way, and yet everything Trump does is flashy. Yeah, no, bipolar, so I'd love to have both of them at the same dinner, in fact. <laughs> <laughs> that, that would be fun. Uh, well, maybe when you actually retire, you can, yeah. you can organize at least some of that, uh, uh, some of that. Listen, I really I thank you so much for doing this. I'm, uh, I'm very honored that you would take the time when I, uh, when I hear the kind of time that you have and the way you, you generally spend it, that you would take uh, an hour to be with, uh, with us here this morning. A final thought. Would you have any advice to give to, to young entrepreneurs who are just starting out? Um, would you encourage them to continue with university? Would a business school be appropriate? Uh, or not? I went to university and you know, well, it's some fun and interesting times. Uh, I don't think I got that much value out of it, to be honest. Uh, you know, I'm on the, the Dean's Board of Advisories out at UBC and uh, trying to help out there and raise, continue to raise funds for the school, etc. But really it's these life experiences, I think, uh, are when, what are going to help create future financial success. Uh, I think you just need to get involved, be out there. Obviously, the old adage, you know, work harder, get up earlier, put in more time and effort. But with that, you got to, you know, find that life balance. That's my, my biggest recommendation and call it my biggest regret of my time. So, Thank you for doing this. Thank you.